Welcome to our PSA Train the Trainer Refresher Office Hour Series. I'm Connie Fisk, PSA's Northwest Regional Extension Associate, and today I'll be sharing tips for presenting Module 1 of the PSA Grower Training Course. First, a little housekeeping. All of you are muted. Please stay muted until we get to the end of the presentation. There will be time for questions and discussion. Um, even if we don't get to all the comments that are in the chat box, we'll address them after the session. This session is being recorded and it will be available on our website after the call. The purpose of this office hour series is to review the critical concepts from each module. This will just be a high level overview to share recent FDA updates, PSA resources, and tips for presenting the PSA grower training course remotely, either via Zoom or other web conferencing um, tools. This series will be most useful for PSA trainers, though other program staff may also benefit from attending. A couple of disclaimers, attending these office hours or watching their recordings does not count as attendance at a PSA train the trainer or grower training course, nor will you earn a certificate of completion. The PSA grower training slides are copyrighted. They may not be published electronically without express permission of Cornell University, nor sold in whole or in part by a third party or company for profit. All right, let's jump into module one. Module one is a really important module because it sets the stage for the whole course. You should use module one to engage all your participants and make sure the course is accessible and inclusive. It's an opportunity to get growers to buy in that this is an important topic and worthy of their investment of time and resources. The flip side of that is that if you don't do a good job in module one, you'll have a tough time keeping their attention throughout the course. Every module begins with learning objectives. You don't need to read them word for word, but it is important to preview what we're gonna cover in the next hour or so. You should look through your assigned module for natural transitions between topics. Adult learners need breaks or interaction at least every 20 minutes as you go through the module, and this allows the content to be better understood and retained. So here are some natural divisions in module one where you might wanna insert engagement elements. And I'll share some of mine as we go through this presentation. Slide four is an important piece of that grower buy-in that I mentioned before. You'll notice that the language on this slide is very direct. You can prevent, you know your farm, your actions directly impact food safety. Okay, so we, we wanna get the grower's attention here right out of the gate. I usually also add another slide here of some of the side benefits to produce quality and shelf life, as well as business success that can come from following the produce safety steps we're gonna talk about in the course. And that's my hook. Produce safety is good for business and the grower is the best person to determine what that will require on their farm. Slides five through eight introduce growers to the regulatory background of the produce safety rule. I spend quite a bit of time on slide six because the content on this slide and in the notes is important to the growers understanding of the course. In particular, I want them to recognize that what, when they see this section symbol at the bottom of the slide, that means there's a rule requirement either on the slide or in the notes. I want them to understand that must and should are used deliberately throughout the course. And if we didn't have an in-depth introduction to the manual before we start module one, I take a few minutes to cover that here. Drawing attention to the FISMA produce safety rule tab that contains the codified language of the rule, as well as the regulatory reference table that makes it easy to see which modules each of those requirements is covered in. And I draw attention to the glossary and the fact that glossary terms will appear in bold throughout the course. So if the trainers are using a word or a phrase like agricultural water in a way that doesn't make sense to the grower, they can look it up in the glossary. And as an example, I usually have the group all look up the word produce in the glossary and I have someone read 
the, the top of that definition. So we're all starting off the course with an understanding of what is included under that heading of produce. And that brings us to slide seven. This is where exemptions and exclusions are covered in the course. I ask growers to flip to the first page of the FDA USDA resources tab in the manual to this flowchart, and then we walk through it question by question. It's important that growers know if their farm is covered or not before we dive into those rural requirements. So I walk them through this fact sheet after slide seven, but you could also cover it before you even begin module one, or you could design your own slides that walk through these questions. We also have a slide set that you can use on our trainer resources webpage. It includes a few multiple choice questions for growers to practice using that flowchart. I draw attention to the list of rarely consumed raw produce. It's in the notes for slide seven. And if growers have any questions about this list, let them know that there's an FDA fact sheet explaining the development of the list that begins on page 20 of the FDA USDA resources section of the manual. Next, we have a supplemental slide describing the enforcement discretion for hops, wine grapes, pulses, and almonds. Again, it's available on our trainer resources webpage. And here's what that slide looks like. Depending on the crops grown in your area, you may want to include this supplemental slide after slide seven. The last question on the FDA flowchart of coverage and exemptions exclusions deals with qualified exemption. So in case growers in the room have determined that they fall in this category, I insert this slide from module seven here to let them know they're only required to keep records and include their name and complete business address at the point of purchase or on packaging. The rest of what we'll cover in this course, they should consider implementing on their farms, but it won't be required if they're qualified exempt. Next, we have a couple supplemental slides describing the enforcement discretion for qualified exemption during COVID-19. Again, these are available on our trainer resources page. So I encourage you to download these slides and insert them after slide seven while we're teaching this course remotely and dealing with COVID-19. And then slide eight covers compliance dates. Okay, shifting gears. You may wanna pause and see if there are any questions before moving on to the next topic, which is microbiology basics. Slides nine through 17 help to get all the participants to a common understanding of a few basic microbiology concepts that are gonna be a good foundation as we move into the topics throughout the course. Slide 10 is an overview slide where you may wanna make a point that the differences between bacteria, viruses, and parasites are relevant on the farm because of different animal versus human sources and different modes of reproduction and survival that are gonna be described in the next few slides in their notes. You may also want to share details of relevant outbreaks, especially if you know growers in the room are growing produce items that have been associated with outbreaks in the past. So this will help make it real for them. It'll be something that they recognize. Slide 12 is the first optional slide in the course, meaning you can choose whether or not to use it. But you should mention to growers that you may skip these optional slides throughout the course so they don't get confused. Another thing I wanna make a point of here is you can see it says slide 12 at the bottom of this slide. If you insert supplemental slides like I did previously in this PowerPoint, that's gonna throw off your automatic numbering which really confuses growers. You'll be able to see them, you'll be able to see that confusion on their face and you'll be able to see them flipping through their book to figure out why the numbers don't match. So if you are adding supplemental slides, I encourage you to delete the automatic numbering at the bottom. Um, so when you're in your PowerPoint, you can view slide master and delete that box. And then you can go back in and add that manually. Now I like to do it that way, but it's a little bit of a, a chore. Um, some of my PSA teammates instead just insert a text box over the top of that 12 um, to make it be the actual number that's in the printed manual. So you can do it either way, but I strongly encourage you to make sure those slide numbers match what's in the printed manual. Um, so again, this slide is optional, 
Um, but I would want to encourage the growers in my training to go back and read these slides and notes if they want more information on this topic. And I might choose to use this depending on my grower audience. Okay, now that we've covered the basic info about bacteria, viruses, and parasites, you may want to ask a question to make sure the growers caught some of those important details. For example, we focus a lot on bacteria in the course. So you may wanna ask a question that makes them think about controlling conditions that bacteria need to survive and multiply. PSA has created a set of slides available on our trainer resources page intended to help you facilitate this kind of thinking and discussion. They're called clicker questions because before COVID, many trainers were using them with handheld clickers that growers could use to anonymously vote for the answer they thought was correct. But now that we're teaching remotely, you may wanna alter these slides for use with Zoom's annotate tool. So I want us to take a minute and practice using that annotate tool. So if you've never used it before, if you go to the top of your screen, you should see an option, it should say view options. So go to view options and then click on annotate. Once you get there, I want you to pick a stamp and place it in the box that you think is the most correct answer. Which of the following conditions for bacterial growth might a grower have the least control over in a packing house? So your name is gonna show next to your stamp right when you place it, but then it's gonna disappear. So it's pretty much anonymous, right? And you can answer more than once. So if you think there are two correct answers, you could answer twice. So I really like using this annotate tool in remote grower trainings because it's pretty simple. The growers seem to enjoy it. Um, and it's an easy way to get that instant feedback. Did they get the important points I wanted them to get from the previous few slides. And so again, bacteria, there are a lot of things that they need to be able to grow and multiply. So yes, I may not be able to control oxygen and pH in my pack house, but I can control time, temperature, and moisture. So this gives you an opportunity to get that feedback, make sure we're all on the right track, but also have a little bit about a little bit of discussion about what we do have control over. So if we can do what we can to disrupt time, temperature, and moisture, then we're gonna be well on our way to controlling bacteria on the farm. And then again, it's really easy once you're the host, you can just go up and clear all those drawings and they go away for the next slide. So again, that's annotate. Slide 16 is another great place to get audience engagement. Here we see health impacts by pathogen type, and growers may think those numbers don't look too bad. I mean, unless, you know, one of the 65 deaths is somebody you know, there might be, they might not think that's too bad considering everybody who eats produce. Uh, but if you ask them to raise their hands, either physically on camera or using the nonverbal feedback in the participant panel, ask them to raise their hands if they've ever eaten something they thought made them sick, right? Most folks in the room are gonna raise their hand for that. Then tell them to keep their hand raised if they were sick enough that they went to the hospital. Um, a lot of hands are gonna drop. Keep them raised if the doctor you saw collected a fecal sample. Keep them raised if the sample was traced back to a specific pathogen. Keep your hand raised if it was then traced back to a specific food. At this point, you probably don't have any hands still raised. Maybe, maybe one or two. But all of a sudden, the growers in your training are gonna realize that the numbers on this slide are much, much lower than the actual cases of foodborne illness. So again, it's an opportunity to drive home how important this information is that we're covering in this course. Slide 17 wraps up this section, talking about food safety challenges of fresh produce. So I usually take the time to go through the notes on this slide. It gives a lot of detail, again, really driving home the point of this section. Slides 18 to 23, describe how contamination is spread on the farm. This is another grower buy-in slide. Do you have any of these on your farm? Of course you do. So you have some risks to consider that we're gonna talk about in this course. Maybe you don't use soil amendments but you use water, you have buildings and tools, et cetera. 
The next few slides introduce each of the topics in the course. So don't spend too much time on each of these slides because it will get in-depth attention later in the course. This is just an introduction. So based on you know, what you know about the growers in your audience, maybe what they mentioned in their introductions when you went around the room at the beginning, you might draw out a couple details from these slides, but otherwise don't spend a lot of detail um, on each of them because we're gonna have a whole, slot, a whole PowerPoint um, on each of these topics later in the course. Slide 24 is so important. It's the only slide that appears twice in the course. So I spend a little extra time driving home the differences between cleaning and sanitizing. Maybe give an example. A lot of trainers mention how you clean up your kitchen after a kid has made themselves a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, first, you're gonna wipe the crumbs off the counter. That's physical removal of soil from the surface. You may even need some soap to break up that peanut butter, right? So that's cleaning. Then if you wipe the surface with a Clorox wipe afterwards, that's the sanitizing step. So again, it's, it's two very separate steps. And then slide 25 is again, grower buy-in. So important in module one to get their buy-in. You wanna empower the growers in your audience. Produce safety on their farm requires their commitment. Again, remember the U's from slide four. You can identify produce safety risks on your farm, right? So you might wanna use that same language here. You can support the implementation of food safety policies and practices to reduce risks. You can provide equipment and facilities. You can support effective training and you can set a good and consistent example on your farm. Because if you don't, your workers aren't going to follow those practices. You have to set a good example. All right, again, shifting gears. So here's another transition. Slides 26 to 37 are the steps to achieving produce safety on the farm. These are the same steps we'll cover in each of the modules of the course. So really stress these steps. This is the exact frame of mind growers need to have and we want them to learn to think strategically. We want this to become a habit. We're gonna assess produce safety risks, implement practices to address those risks, then monitor those practices, make sure they're getting done the way we want them done, use corrective actions when something goes wrong and keep records. So we want our growers to learn to think strategically, to learn to use these five steps. So again, assessing risks. This is again, just an introduction slide. This will be covered throughout the course. So we don't wanna to spend too much time getting into the weeds here. Just give a couple relevant examples based on your audience. Slide 29 is a reminder that much of what we present in this course is good agricultural practices. These are practices we can implement to reduce risks, even though they're not specific rule requirements. They are ways that we can meet some of those rule requirements. SOPs. They are not required by the produce safety rule, but we do mention them throughout the course as a recommendation, a way to make sure workers are following the practices that a grower wants implemented on the farm. So again, it's really important in module one to spend a little time on definitions. Make sure the growers in the room understand what an SOP is, understand what it includes. So I take a minute here to drive home the definition of an SOP. Unless you're working with only experienced growers, those that have been through a gap audit, for example, it's worth spending a few minutes going over definitions like this. And also remember, if you add a slide to, to get rid of the PSA background so that growers aren't confused about where this slide came from. And you can do that by just right clicking and then formatting um, the background of that slide. So I use this slide of this really pretty cake um, I don't think I could even make a cake that looked this good, but it's a good example. Um, I asked the growers in my training to think of an SOP as a recipe card. It provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete a task that needs to be done for produce safety. It also includes where the supplies are located to complete the task and how often the task should be completed. So to build on this analogy, if I write enough detail into my cake recipe, including where to find the necessary equipment and ingredients, I should be able to hand that recipe to my teenager and expect them to create the same cake if I put enough detail into it. 
right? That's the big if. All right, then we have monitoring, corrective actions, and every module concludes with step five, record keeping. This is a good place to mention PSA's fact sheet, required records by the FSMA produce safety rule that's available on our grower resources page, along with editable templates in Microsoft Word. And you can have one of your coworkers paste the links in the chat while you present. I strongly encourage you to work together as a training team to think about all the engagement elements you wanna use through the course, as well as what links to additional information you would like to share. So that when you're presenting, you can focus just on your PowerPoint and what you've planned as your engagement elements, while somebody else on your training team can worry about monitoring the chat, um, monitoring participation, and, and adding those links that you want shared. There's a lot more information about record keeping to go through. And then slide 54 introduces the topic of module seven. But again, this is just an introduction. So don't go into too much detail here because it will be covered later in the course. And finally, the summary slide. Again, don't just read off the slide, but it is important to review the highlights of what you just covered. What do you wanna make sure your unique group of growers remembers from this module? And do you have your buy-in, right? Have they, have they bought into the importance of produce safety? Are they going to go into the next module with an open mind, thinking about what they can do to implement these practices on their farm? And if not, you might need to have a little bit more discussion here. And then the final tip I would give you is that when you're done with your summary slide, I would stop sharing my screen so that you can have that discussion, so that you can see people's faces and, and everybody can see everybody else's faces. Use that gallery view of, of videos. Um, that will also help you make sure that folks are still in the room, they're still paying attention, because we know how distracting it can be to attend a Zoom training. Um, there's a lot going on in our homes and our offices that make it easy to get distracted from watching a PowerPoint. So that's one way that we can bring everybody back to attention, that we can wake everybody back up again is by stopping to share um, stop sharing our PowerPoint to have that discussion. So that's what we're going to do now. All right. And I know I went really fast. That's the intention of these office hours is to just give that high level overview. Some of those things that we really want to make sure our trainers are remembering to hit on as they go through each one of these modules.